out the shadow of death. Your perfect love is casting our fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. Sing it. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I Yeah.
Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the ones in need. For every thirst and every hunger, you are everything. Blessed are the worn and weary. Blessed are the ones who See you in 
Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors as an example of suffering and patience. Beloved, take the prophets who spoke the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who showed endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my beloved, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and let your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Good evening. Hey, as we, uh, as we come to towards the end of the close of this campus community, I wanted to start by just saying thank you to each and every one of you, the faithful, consistent obedience that you've reflected has been such an inspiration, uh, honestly, to me this past year. Um, I always enjoy just getting the opportunity to hear and talk to some of you and just to see your passion and your desire and your hunger uh, is so encouraging. So thank you. Um, tonight, James 5, 7 through 12. Um, <clears throat> think about this with me for a second. If you were to invite me to an event and you told me uh, to wear a tie, I would presume that where we're going is going to be formal. If you were to tell me to wear a coat, then I would presume that where we're going is going to be cold. And if you were to tell me, I don't know, like, hey, where we're going, keep your eyes open, be alert, well, then I would presume that the place we're going is not safe. In other words, how you tell me to act in a given situation tells me a lot about how you are assessing the overall situation. Well, as we come to the end of James, I don't know if you've noticed this about James. James hasn't, hasn't shied away from telling us how to act a lot. There's been a whole lot of do this, don't do that throughout the letter of James. But isn't it interesting that as we come to the end, the final two commands that James leaves us with are be patient and pray. Be patient and pray. And if you'll remember, it's very similar to how he started this letter. Keep steadfast when you encounter various trials. A call to perseverance. In fact, the word he uses in James 1 for steadfast is the same word that he uses in James 5 verse 11 for perseverance. Be patient persevere, be steadfast. They're the bookends of the letter of James. And if how you tell me to act tells me a lot about how you assess the situation, then in the same way, James telling you and me to be patient tells me a lot about how James understands the Christian life, what it means to be a Christian. And that's what I want to show you tonight. Let's look at the text. Beginning in verse 7, he writes, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Be patient. Let's talk about patience for a minute. I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that patience, when it's used in Scripture, means passivity, as in don't do anything. But like I just said, if we've been reading James, James presumes that you and I are doing a lot. So don't presume or don't make the mistake of thinking that when he says be patient, he means 
passivity. Rather, the, the patience that James has in mind, in fact, the very word he uses in this text, this letter, the word patience there in the Greek can be used in, is used elsewhere to refer to the kind of patience that you need in a military situation. The imagery, in other words, that James wants you and I to have in mind is almost like a soldier crouched in the bunker waiting for the call to charge. Think about it. Like, hold. Not yet. Hold. In other words, it's the kind of patience that makes you sweat. It's work. Patience here in James does not mean doing nothing, but it often looks like learning how to say no in order to then say yes at the right time. And this idea of patience is not unique to James. All throughout Scripture, there is a consistent refrain to wait, to be patient and to wait. Uh, for example, in the minor prophet Hosea, chapter 12, the prophet implores Israel to do this. Return to your God, hold fast to love and justice, and wait continually for your God. Question for you. If you, if I told you to wait continually for something, how long do you think you'd be waiting? You guys want to take a stab? Long time. A long time? Anyone want to, if I told you to wait continually, anyone else? How long would you be waiting? Continually. <laughs> if I told you to wait continually for something, you're going to be waiting continually for it. It's a paradox. You're waiting forever if you're waiting continually. The point is, in the Christian life, you and I are always waiting. For who? God. Another way to think of it is like this. The call to be patient in Scripture to wait continually for God presumes a life of expectant preparation for God to affirm in our own lives what he has said is true. Think about it like this. Think about your own life, look back on your own life, and think about how many times God has proven himself faithful. Think about how many times God has proven himself true. But now look ahead to your life, what you're dealing with right now, and think about all the ways that you're waiting on God to do it again. You and I are always waiting, friends, continually waiting on God. But notice for James how this command to be patient is grounded in his expectation that the Lord is near. Three times in three verses, he says, the reason for our patience is because the Lord is coming, the judge is standing at the door. Most commentators in church history agree that what James has in mind here is the second coming of Christ. But that does not mean that we should conclude that James expected the final coming of Christ to happen in his reader's lifetime. For one thing, every single original recipient of the letter of James is dead. So was James wrong to tell them that the Lord is near? No. Here's, here's what he's doing. Let's think about the final coming of Christ for a second. I hope this is not news to this room, but there really is a day when Jesus Christ is coming back, right? That is, that is going to happen, right? And when he does come back, there really will be a final day of judgment. And the final day of judgment is nothing less than the vindication of everything that God ever said or did that was true. In other words, final judgment means every single person, believer or unbeliever, is going to know on that day this central truth that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. Another way to put that, Jesus was right. He was right about life, 
death, salvation, sin, eternity, God, judgment. He was right about all of it, about all of it. And that day will be the vindication of everything that he ever said was true, which means that every lie that was ever spoken will be revealed on that day as a lie. That means that every injustice that was ever perpetuated on this earth will be judged as precisely that, unjust. The imagery in Scripture is one of complete exposure. Right? In other words, no one on the final day is going, well, that's your perspective. I, I saw it differently. Right? It's just all the lights are on. No sleight of hand, no shade, no double standard. God will be proven true. Will be proven true. We could spend a lot of time unpacking exactly all the places in Scripture where that is true. But honestly, like, if, if you want to read more about it, there's this really great book I would recommend to you. It's called The Bible, and it just unpack like... We could have pulled so many verses, right, where Jesus unpacks the truth. It's not going to be a surprise if you've read Scripture. But here's the thing. Oftentimes in life, oftentimes in our lives, God will act in the present in a way that is a foretaste of that final day. You see this often in Scripture. Um, like, for instance, the, uh, the prophet Joel um, Sticking with the minor prophet theme tonight, the prophet Joel uh, in his prophecy is, is, uh, is prophesying about a plague of locusts that is coming on Israel. And he tells in his, in his, in his uh, prophecy, he says that this is a day of judgment. This is the day of the Lord. In other words, what he says is this day for Israel this plague of locusts on you, right, is God just proving what he has said is true. In other words, I told you, Israel, if you do this, if you do this, if you go against the grain, it's not going to end well. Like, it's, you're going to lose. And so Joel can look at that little day, that day of judgment, cause... Oh, sorry, guys. Um, he calls it the day of judgment, but then by the end of his prophecy, sure, we're going to switch it up here, guys. Boom. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, let's get back. Uh, the prophet Joel can refer to that plague of locusts as a day of judgment, but then he can use that same day to say, hey, Israel, this is just a foretaste of that final day of judgment. Um, if you've ever experienced the right judgment of any situation, you've experienced a little taste of the final day of the Lord. What's my point? Simply this, to say that the Lord is near, to say that the judge is out the door can refer to any day where what God said was going to happen, happens. It can refer to any day where God is vindicated. Some of you in here might have experienced your own little day of the Lord in your own lives or in your own families. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The fact that it seems sometimes like sin goes unpunished, like injustice continues and the people who commit it will get away with it is an illusion. Right? The entire history of humanity is one consistent witness 
of men and women in their sin and pride, always losing. And God always being proven true. And you and I, our own lives, are witness to that as well. The point is when James says the judge is standing at the door, I don't think he means that the universe is ending tomorrow. Because James doesn't know when that day's coming, and nor does anyone else. Rather, I think what James means is live life in expectation that the judge will not be mocked. That the injustice will be made right, and you might have to wait five years, you might have to wait 10 years, you might have to wait 50 years, you might have to wait until the last day, but truth is still gonna be the truth even if everyone believed the lie. And on the final day, it's all made right. But, but it could happen today as well. And that's what I think James means. In the end, God will be proven true, certainly on the last day, but it might be today. Which means, if you are caught right now in the gap between what God has said is true and what you are currently experiencing in your life, what James is saying is, be patient. Why? Because the Lord is near. Does that make sense? If you're in the gap between what God said is true, what I know is true in his word, and yet my own experience seems to indicate that this doesn't feel right. What happened to the thing that I believed? If you're in that gap, what James is saying is be patient because the Lord is near. And as we saw earlier, for James, the entire Christian life is lived in the gap. The gap between what we trust is true and what you and I are oftentimes experiencing in our own lives. The gap between what God has said and done and are waiting for God to reveal it or affirm it as true. It works like this. I trust Christ, but a tornado just came through the neighborhood and I lost my child. I trust Christ, but I live over in the Ukraine and I don't, I don't know if at any minute a missile's about to come through my door. I trust Christ, but I was abused and the person got away with it. I, will, I trust Christ, but I was falsely accused and everyone believed the other person. I trust Christ, but the diagnosis came back and it's not good. I trust Christ, but I lost my job and I don't know how I'm gonna provide for my family. I trust Christ, but I trust Christ, but I'm in the middle of this gap and I'm not sure what to do with it. What James is saying is be patient because the judge of all things, even of the small things that seems insignificant is near. And Jesus said, nothing is hidden that will not be disclosed. That is, no one is going to get away with it. No one. And I don't know how long it will take for God to come through the door, maybe in your own experience, your own gap, but it's not as far off as it feels. And it might be today. See, notice how at one and the same time, it's supposed to comfort for those who are suffering, and it's a warning for those who are perpetuating the suffering. How do I know what this is? How do I know this is what James means? Because look at the example that he gives in verse 10. 
and 11. He gives the story of Job. Job is a really telling example for James to bring up here. Because who more than Job could say, I trust God, but. Job was a man who was blameless and upright, one who feared God and who turned away from evil. That's pretty high praise to have written down in the inspired word of God about you. And yet, lost his family, lost his wealth, lost his reputation, lost his friends. Talk about a life in the gap. Job trusted God, but that trust was challenged by his own experience, but he held firm and he did not fall away. If you read the scriptures, particularly the Psalms, you'll see this pattern come up over and over again. It works like this. God, I trust you. I praise you. You're awesome. But problems, so many problems, so many things that I don't understand, that are happening, so much pain, but I trust you, I praise you, you're awesome. That's the Josh Rutledge message translation of the Psalms. You should read them. It's the pattern. It shows up over and over again. And there's a reason for that pattern. The Psalms are the Psalm book, are the prayer book of the Christian life, which means the whole point is that you and I in prayer are inviting God into the gap. Why? Because we want him to fix it. Right? Come and render judgment, God. Like come and vindicate the situation. Vindicate it in truth. Resolve the gap between what I know is true about you and what I'm staring at in my own experience. That's the story of Job. And check out verse 11. He says, you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord has finally brought about. What James is saying is that the reason for our patience is precisely because the truth of what God has said will be vindicated. That was true in Job's life. It will be true in all of those who trust God. On some level, friends, this is black and white. God is either telling the truth or he's not. You can either trust him or you can trust something else. But if you've chosen to trust God, if you believe that God in Christ is telling you the truth about yourself, about what's to come, about eternity, if you choose to believe that, then the only real option, friends, is to wait for him to affirm and reveal that in your own life. The only option is to be patient and to trust It was true for Job, it will be true for you. Though I should add, as an important aside, notice that I said God will be vindicated. Whether or not I am vindicated is something else entirely. And sometimes I think we like to confuse the two. That what I'm waiting for is finally for Josh Rutledge to be proven right. But that's not the promise. The promise is that God is proven right. Right. And full confession, I'm really good at telling God how I would be God if I were him. But I also know that I can look back in my own life and look at prayers that I have prayed. And the only thing that I can say now is thank God he didn't do what I thought he should do. Thank God he didn't do what I thought he should do. I didn't know the first clue. I'm a horrible judge of a situation. It's not that I just know a little bit of it. You and I don't know anything. And so I've learned in my own life, I've just stopped telling God what I think he should do. I've come up with this better idea. I just pray and I invite God into the gap and I go, God, would you do whatever God does? Like, however you want to assess it, I think I'll just trust that. It's a very different kind of prayer. It kind of works like this. Um, In my house right now, my wife and I have uh, three children, um, a five-year-old and two three-year-olds. 
And can I tell you what is the most commonly uttered word in our house? More than every other word combined. Mommy. (laughs) And if you're wondering where does dad fit in that picture, dad is fairly high on the list, but it does not come close to mommy. And every single mom who's watching on the live stream is nodding right now. Mommy. If somebody is hurt, mommy. If somebody found a really cool bug, mommy. If someone is scared, mommy. Last night, 2.30 a.m., mommy. (laughs) What, what did he need? What's what's wrong? He was hungry, right? (laughs) If somebody is, if somebody is just seeing something else that another sibling's doing and they're not sure what's going on, mommy. If someone's frightened, mommy. If someone's hurt, Mommy. And here's the deal with it. It's not as if normally the mommy part is followed up with explicit instructions about how to deal with it. Rather, it just works like this. All we're doing is calling mommy into this situation and we'll just let her assess it and deal with it however mom would. It's just blind trust and faith that if mommy walks through the door, it'll probably be all right. And you guys probably know where I'm going with this. There's a reason why the God of the universe invites human beings, you and me, to understand the relationship between us and him as a child to a parent. That's profound. The difference, of course, is that God as Father far exceeds, far exceeds any earthly mom or dad. Earthly moms and dads grow weary. Ask one. It actually gets really old to hear mommy over and over, but the God of all the universe never tires of hearing his own children call out to him. How do I know this? Because look at what James says next in verse 11. He says, you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Do not miss this. This is, this is not just James deciding we should say something nice about God here. This is the entire climax of the entire passage. Right, this is the moment in the passage when you and I should go, oh, wow. Because think about it. The God, James is saying, the God that you and I are waiting for, the God he is telling you and me to be patient and wait for, the judge standing at the door, has revealed himself in Christ as merciful and compassionate. He is a merciful and compassionate judge. Now, you and I often struggle to see how those things could possibly work. Hang on, we think. Like, don't you want a judge who is objective? Right? How can a merciful judge also be a just judge. Well, it's called the gospel. The justice of God is satisfied through the mercy of God. The whole point of the cross is that in Jesus Christ, justice and mercy meet which means the justice of God is not at odds with the mercy of God. Rather, the justice of God is satisfied through the mercy of God. That's why James wrote in chapter two, mercy triumphs over judgment. And that is really good news for you and me. But I'll say here just as an aside, And not to get too far off track, but I was listening to a sermon one time, and afterwards, um, I don't even remember who preached the sermon, but afterwards, I overheard somebody say, 
Uh, man, thank God somebody finally talked about the wrath of God. All, I've, all anyone ever preaches about anymore is grace. And I thought, one, you don't understand grace if you think that it excludes conversation about the wrath of God. But also, wow, be careful. There's something in us that when, that when we hear that the judge standing at the door is merciful and compassionate, there's something in at least some of us that goes, huh. There's a couple people I know who, man, I kind of just wish he would like show up in his wrath. Well, is he going to show mercy to them? kind of wish that he would show up and just, and just put that part aside and look, look at what they're doing. And they got it coming for them. And all I want to say is be careful. Because here's the, here's the catch on that. The measure that you use will be measured against you. So good news and bad news. If that's what you think, you'll get what you want. The only problem is you'll have to face that judgment. (laughs) That's what James said in chapter 2. Mercy triumphs over judgment, but judgment without mercy is shown to those who don't show it. In other words, do not miss in your pride, friends, The unimaginably good news here, the one who can do something about your situation, the one who could fix it, can fix it, not only is willing to fix it, but desires it, visits you with compassion, delights in showing mercy. And you might go, okay, I get that. But how does that work in my actual situation? The gap that I am in right now. Like, if God is merciful, and praise God for it, but what does that mean for this situation that I am in right now? How's he gonna make it right then? Is the other person just gonna get away with it? Like, how, how can God be merciful and also fix this injustice maybe that I have experienced? How can God make it all right and still be able to say that mercy triumphs over judgment? And it's a good question. And here's my answer. You ready for this? I don't know. I don't know how the merciful judge will still make every situation right. I don't know how everything fits together in your life, in my life, for his eternal purpose. I know the big picture. I know what he's done on cross. I I know that, but what you have faced, what you are facing, the gap, the inconsistency, it's what Job faced. How how are you going to fix this, God? I don't know. But here's the thing. I don't need to know how it gets fixed if I know who is going to fix it. I don't need to know how if I know who. Just like my children don't need to know how mom is going to fix it. They just know mom. And they have come to trust that if she walks through the door, she'll know what to do. And in much the same way, friends, I don't need to know how God will make right the gap in my life, in your life. I just need to know who, and who is Christ, and Christ is merciful. And there is no one you want coming through the door in the night more than the one who not only can fix it, but delights in fixing it, wants to fix it. 
promises to fix it. And will answer every single person that calls out to him for it. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. And he will not visit you in wrath. If you call out to him, in the night of your own affliction, if you cry out for mercy, God will not visit you in his wrath. He will visit you in mercy. And here's why that's so important. Because if you do not trust that God wills your good, desires your good, desires your repentance, desires to show mercy to you, you will not call out to him. You will hide from him. If you're convinced he's coming in wrath, then you're going to hide. But if you have come to know and trust that the God who can fix it wants to fix it, wants you, then you'll call out to him. You'll trust him. Interesting that James's next verse in our passage takes what seems like an odd turn. He writes, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. It seems like a bizarre left turn. What, what on earth does not swearing have to do with everything we've talked about? I thought we were talking about being patient, James. I think it has a lot, actually. In fact, it relates to verse 9, which we jumped over, when James warned believers not to grumble. Think about it like this. What would be the evidence in your life that you're not trusting, not being patient, not waiting for God? Bitterness, anger, a grumbling and complaining and controlling spirit. Elizabeth Elliot said once, I think we could divide the world into two classes, the people who make a habit of complaining about what they haven't got or what they have got, and those who make a habit of saying, thank you, Lord, for what they haven't got and what they have got. See, there's only two responses for life in the gap. There's only two ways to respond to life in the gap. You can grow bitter and you can spend your life grumbling and trying to manipulate outcomes to get what you want. I think that's why James gives a warning there about swearing. Because if you find yourself in a spot where your yes and no is not enough, then you are not trusting. If you find yourself in the spot where you have to put the squeeze on and go, I swear it was this way, then you're not being patient. The only time that shows up in the New Testament where someone swears out and calls out on something to be held was when Peter swore he didn't know Jesus. He's not trusting. That's not patient. And James is going, don't do that. In other words, even if you're right, don't cheat. Don't try to twist it. Don't try to like just squeeze and get everyone on the same page just to make sure that like we'll get it don't cheat don't manipulate wait on the judge because the other response to a life lived in the gap is joy and gratitude and what I mean by that hear me out is not some sort of pseudo-psychological nonsense about the power of positive thinking. The only reason that you and I can be patient and count it all joy is only if Jesus really is Lord. 
If Jesus is not Lord, if the judge is not at the door, then life is just simply not worth the risk. And no amount of secular spin about positive thinking can change the reality that when we cry out, we're just crying into an empty void. If the judge is not standing at the door, then my pain is just that, pain. If the judge is not standing at the door, then every injustice ever committed is just the byproduct of evolution and we've made a name for it called injustice when really it's just the inevitable result of when the weak get crushed by the strong. If the judge is not standing at the door, then it's not worth it. But if, if the judge standing at the door is a gracious and compassionate father who has revealed his merciful character in the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, then you and I could smile and keep smiling while we wait even in the darkest gap, the darkest night, because we would know that at worst, all of it is just light and momentary trouble that is achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Let's pray together. God, I pray that you would meet us in our own gap, the gap between what we believe and know and trust is true, and yet what often seems like our own experience. God, I pray for somebody in this room tonight who is clinging to trust in the face of injustice or pain or confusion or doubt. And God, I pray that you would answer quickly. God, I pray that we would be marked as a people. I pray that this campus would be marked by students who don't simply know the right things, who don't simply have the right answers to things, I pray that we would be marked by a joy that comes off a spirit of gratitude because we have come to know the one who answers when we call. And God, I pray that that joy, that smile would demand an answer from the world. And God, I pray that through that joy, then we would just point them to the one who stands waiting to show mercy. Pray this in your holy name. Amen.
Lord, you have never failed me. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me. Your promise is said, great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness, I'm sealing your hands, this is my confidence, you never fail me, yeah. you never fail me.
Amen. Hey, we uh, are coming to the end tonight of the shoe drive that we've been doing over the course of this series in James. And honestly, it was it was put on a couple of our team's heart when we were we were reading James, and we felt like that passage where James says, "Right, if you see your brother in distress." and you see someone without a coat and you just say, go and be well, then what credit is that to you? Um, And so our shoe drive is all going toward a foundation called the Tibonera Foundation, which is led by a handful of brothers and sisters, most of whom sat where you sat. Um, And a couple of them are with us here tonight. Um, Emmanuel Tibonera is sort of the the face of it, and he was a student here at Liberty from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and he and his family and his brothers um, consistently go back to the Congo and try to bring supplies and shoes in particular uh, to those who need them desperately there. So he's here tonight. Um, In fact, after this, he and his, uh, a couple of his brothers are going to be up at gate two at a table there if you wanted to go over and just shake their hand. But I asked him... um, to come on up and just share his own sort of thanks to those of you who donated and also share just briefly where they're going to be going from here. So Emmanuel, come on up, brother. Hello, everyone. How is everyone doing today? Are you guys excited to be in the presence of God? Come on. Are you happy? Oh, I know. I know you guys are trying to rush and go back to your dorms, but let me just get you two uh, and three minutes of your time. I want to tell you the reason why we collect shoes, and I want to tell you why the shoes and where the shoes are going. I remember one time when I, I was a refugee in Kenya, I lacked a proper footwear, and I loved going to church, I loved praising God, and I loved worshiping, but I was so embarrassed because I could not have a proper footwear. And my mom would take me to prayers all the time, and I'll go. So one day, one time, they asked me, is anybody that has a need? I said, I have a need. They asked me, what's your need? I said, I need a proper footwear, because I'm embarrassed to go to church without a shoes that looks like it's decent. And they told me, go on your knees. And I went on my knees, and I raised my hands, and I prayed to God. They laid, my, they laid their hands on me and prayed for me. So that I can get a proper footwear. And after a few days, one of the couple that was in the prayer meeting came to me and said, you know what? God touched me that I should get you a brand new pair of shoes. And I was excited. On Sunday, I was in church praising God and jumping up and saying, thank you, Jesus. I finally got a brand new pair of shoes because my parents could not afford one. Nobody knew that God was writing my story. Since 2017, until now, Tibonera Foundation, with my brothers, we have been able to deliver more than 50,000 sneakers to children in the Congo. I just want to tell you how God answers prayers and how he performs miracles and you are the answers of so many prayers out there when we collect your shoes we take it to the congo there's children in the cobalt mining that cannot afford a pair of shoes of shoes there is children in these villages that have never put on a pair of shoes and chill people are dying due to lack of proper footwear when we collect We ship it back to the Congo. We tell them about God and we bless them with a pair of shoes. Let me tell you what a pair of shoes means to me. When I give this child a pair of shoes, for me it's freedom, it's courage to stand up again and walk. Because these kids, the soil is contaminated. They are not able to go to school because they don't have shoes on. But when I give them a pair of shoes, I'm telling them stand up again and walk and go back to school and do your daily activities. God has blessed us so much. It's just not about me. It's not about none of us here. It's about God. I'm using a pair of shoes to transform lives. 
what are you doing for the kingdom of God? And you are the answer. The Bible says, for whoever much has been given, much is required. God bless you all. You can see us on, on, I don't know what get they said. I'll be standing over there. I was in the bookstore as well. I did sign some of my books for you guys. You can go get them. Get Congo Soul. It's everywhere. And read the testimony of how we need men and women to get out and spread the love of course. It doesn't matter what way you're going to use. I'm using a pair of shoes. What are you using to spread the love of Christ? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Hey, go by and check them out afterwards. I know they'd love to shake your hand and get to meet you. Hey, guys, next week is our last campus community for the semester. And we're going we're gonna to leave Vines and we're going to take it outside. So the last... The last campus community, when James talks about prayer, we're going to do it out on Montview Lawn. Uh, same time, uh, we'll get more information. The hope is to have like starting at like five o'clock next week, we're going to have like a bunch of the local food trucks out by the tower area. So you guys can come early. Uh, starting at seven, we'll do campus community. At the end of that, we're going to have an extended time of prayer and worship out there on the lawn. And then, and then at the end of that, we're going to dismiss from the lawn. And honestly, when we go back to community groups, um, RSs and RAs got an email today. We're just going to empower uh, leadership on the hall next Wednesday evening um, to just pray. And we'll just keep praying. And my vision for it is that we'll go till 8 o'clock the next day. But it won't be in any sort of big group gathering. It's just going to be what you, what you guys feel led to do on your own residence hall. So next Wednesday, Montview Lawn, 7 o'clock, last campus community. We're going to go out with a shout and a bang. Can't wait to see you there. You guys have a great night. You're dismissed.